In the last few weeks, we've been discussing becoming a good steward of life. And we recognize that whenever we say the word stewardship, it's usually in some way, shape, or form, almost always meaning money in some way, shape, or form. But we recognize, and we have, I trust, the last couple of weeks, that God has entrusted to us far more than money. And we've been talking about how God expects us to become a good steward of our time, our talent, and then today we're going to be talking about truth, and next week we're going to talk about our treasure. We define stewardship as the act of directing or managing the affairs and concerns of someone else. So you understand that when we accept Jesus into our hearts, we ask him to forgive us of our sin. At that moment, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians 1 says. And when we transfer kingdoms, we also recognize that the king of our new kingdom deserves our allegiance. And everything in that kingdom is his. The sooner we learn that, the sooner we learn to be good stewards of the things and the possessions and his affairs as the king over our kingdom. A lot of times we stumble there, don't we? Because we fail to recognize he's the king of the kingdom and that everything is his. Time is his. He is sovereign over time. He's the master of time. And if he so chooses to give it to us, which it looks like he's done to all of you, you don't look quite like you're ready to drop out yet. But this past week, God expected you to be a good steward of seven days and then 24 hours within those days and then 60 minutes within those hours and 60 seconds within those minutes. God fully expects you to use your time wisely. And when we talked about this, we talked about three specific things, prioritizing your time, energizing your time, strategizing your time, recognizing that as I serve the king of this new kingdom, he deserves me to use my time wisely. Secondly, we talked about how God expects us to be good stewards of our talent. And by that, last week, we talked about not only those abilities, but those supernatural gifts that God has also given us. (laughs) Both our gift and our talents are special endowments, endowments from our king, and he expects us to serve the body with our gifts and bring him glory. Today then, how does God expect me to become a good steward of truth? Now, I want you to think about this a moment. And I was talking with a good friend of mine last night out at the New London Reservoir. He's here camping with his family. And we got talking about truth. And it was interesting because he doesn't know Jesus yet. We're praying for him that way. And here's what he said to me. He goes, Doug, I don't know how you do what you do, but I tend to think that guys like you do it better than guys who have all these counseling degrees. He goes, I don't know why I believe that. I thought, hmm. I said, can I offer maybe one reason why that might be true? And he goes, can I answer that for you? I can't wait. Here's what he said. I bet it's because you base what you say By this book. I said, there's something to be said when a non believer understands the role of truth. We live in a day where it's not only hard to tell the truth, it's hard to live the truth. There was a farmer, his name was Clyde. He was in a tractor accident (coughs) in court. Company, at least the truck that hit him, had a fancy lawyer, hotshot lawyer, and he was questioning Clyde. Clyde was on the stand, and he said, Clyde, didn't you say at the scene of the accident that you were fine? Clyde began to answer his inquiry, and he said, well, 
I'll tell you what happened. I had just loaded my favorite cow, Bessie, into the... And right then, the lawyer interrupted him, and he said, Clyde, I didn't ask for any of the details. Just answer the question, please. Did you or did you not, at the scene of the accident, say, I am fine? Clyde said, well, I had just gotten Bessie into the trailer behind the tractor, and I was driving down the road. And once again, the lawyer interrupted him. And said, Your Honor, I'm trying to establish the fact that at the scene of the accident, this man told the highway patrolman at the scene that he was just fine. Now, several weeks after the accident, he's trying to sue my client. I believe he is a fraud. Tell him to simply answer the question. By this time, the judge was at least fairly piqued in his interest And he looked at the lawyer and he said, well, you know what? I'd like to hear what he has to say about his favorite cow, Bessie. And he looked at Clyde and he said, Clyde, please proceed. Clyde very politely thanked the judge and then he said, well, as I was saying, I had just loaded Bessie, my favorite cow, into the trailer and was driving her down the highway when this huge semi-truck and trailer ran the stop sign and smacked my John Deere tractor right in the side. I was thrown from my tractor and I was thrown into one ditch. Bessie flew out of the trailer into the other ditch. I was hurting, Judge, I was hurting real bad and I didn't want to move. However, I could hear old Bessie moaning across the road in the ditch, and she was moaning and groaning. I knew she was in terrible shape just by her groans. Shortly after this, a highway patrolman came on the scene, and he could hear Bessie moaning and groaning, so he went over to her, and he looked at her, saw her fatal condition, took out his gun, shot her between the eyes. Then the patrolman crossed the road, gun still in hand, and he looked at me and he said, how are you feeling? (laughs) Then Clyde turned and looked at the judge and he said, now tell me, what the heck would you say? (laughs) Sometimes telling the truth is hard. Sometimes it's hard because we really don't know the truth. But it's exponentially harder to live the truth. This morning, I'm going to talk about three principles that will allow us not only to live the truth, but to be good stewards of the truth that God has entrusted to us. I want to say this blanket statement first before I get into those three principles. You and I as kingdom dwellers in this new kingdom serving under this brand new king of ours, we are the only purveyors of truth that God has on this globe. We're it. And if we don't do a good job of taking care of the truth that he has entrusted to us, then it's not going to come anywhere else. So what does it take to be a good steward of truth? First principle, and if you're following along, you'll see this is Roman numeral number one. Fill in the blank. Trust must be, sorry, truth must be guarded, not hoarded. Truth must be guarded. 2 Timothy 1 verses 13 and 14 says... Retain the standard of sound words, that's truth, which you have heard from me in the faith and the love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard the standard of truth, this wonderful truth treasure that God has given to us, and we need to guard it. Well, why does truth need to be guarded? I believe there are three very specific answers. First, because there are a plethora of false teachers spreading false teaching. In a few weeks, maybe a few weeks from now, I'm going to start a sermon series, and I'm going to be preaching through the book of Jude. Not a very popular book, 
very short book. It only has one uh, chapter in it. But Jude is very pointed, and I'm not going to take the time to read it this morning. I give you the, the verses, Jude 3 and 4, <clears throat> and also Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And I'm telling you, there's others. There's 1 John, the Gospel of John. There's all kinds of references in the Word that allow us to know that we are not the only ones who are projecting a message. There are lots of people around us, especially in this day and age, there are plenty on TV. All you have to do is flick your channel on and you will find a purveyor of false teaching. It's easy to find. And if we don't represent the truth, if we don't steward the truth of God well, then the false teachers are going to gain further ground. And there's a lot of them out there. The second reason is because the message of greatest value deserves the greatest protection. Our message, this truth that God proclaims all through this book is all about Jesus. And what Jesus has given to each and every one of us who simply believe and receive. John 1.12 says, but as many as believed in him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who receive him. Guys, do you hear the eternal value that? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave so that whosoever has what? That's eternal value. Do you get it that what's written in these pages is not just temporal words? What's written here will last for all of eternity. This book makes it into eternity. There's lots of things that aren't going to make it. My truck won't make it. It's sad, but it's true. Matter of fact, it's trying to not make it right now. But the Word of God, this truth, it's eternal. And it will last forever. And it will abide forever. We have the message of greatest value. And that message of greatest value deserves the greatest protection. Thirdly, Truth needs to be guarded because we are living in a post-truth culture. Now, how many of you had uh, gone to Beulah Beach at the Bible Missionary Conference? You guys remember Abdu Murray? He's a Christian apologist, and I'm, I'm going to show a little two-and-a-half-minute video clip, not from Beulah Beach, because honestly, his sermon went about 40 minutes but I'm going to show just a little two-minute clip. He does a great job of defining what we are in right now. He's a Christian apologist, and he was asked this question, and I believe you'll hear it on the clip. Are we living in a post-truth culture? Listen to what he says. Would you say that we are in a post-truth culture? I think the answer is a resounding yes to that, actually, and I think that it's very different than a postmodern culture. Postmodernism rejected the idea of objective truth altogether, and of course, that's self-defeating, as you well know. You know, if someone says there's no such thing as truth, you simply ask them, is that statement true, and it all falls apart. Post-truth is different. Post-truth doesn't reject truth's existence, it just subordinates it to feelings and preferences. So a post-truth person would say, yeah, there's objective truth, but if it conflicts with my preferences, then I don't care. My preferences matter more. So something is post-truth if it elevates feelings and preferences above truth and facts. And I think what you're seeing today, whether it's in the realm of politics, whether it's in the realm of sexuality, whether it's in the realm of religion, is a post-truth culture that elevates those preferences to the point where if I don't uh, affirm your preferences, now I'm labeled ha hateful things like bigot or fascist or whatever it might be. And on all sides we're doing this, on all sides, because we're elevating our agendas above what's true actually. I think the way to actually combat that and to come back at this post-truth culture is forming solid argument, but also showing people what the consequences of living in a post-truth culture actually are. And the consequences are we lose our sense of reason. We lose our sense of accountability because our preferences matter more than anything else. And we lose our sense of human value. How is that the case? Well, think about it. Um, 
We're no longer talking about freedom in this country. We use the word freedom. What we really mean is autonomy. And autonomy comes from two Greek words, autos meaning self, nomos meaning law. So we don't want to be free, we want to be laws unto ourselves. Freedom has boundaries, and that boundary is truth. When you're autonomous, you are a law unto yourself. Here's the problem. If my preferences matter more than truth, and someone else's preferences matter more than truth, and I'm a law unto myself, and that person's a law unto themselves, when my preferences clash with their preferences, Truth won't be the deciding factor because truth is on the bottom shelf. It won't be truth, it'll be power. And that is a recipe for chaos where we lose reason, accountability, and a sense of human value. And that's what happens when truth is gone. We become enslaved to our autonomy, which is why Jesus so remarkably says in John chapter 8, if you will know the truth and this truth will set you free. Jesus links truth and freedom. Post-truth says autonomy leads to freedom. Jesus says, it's truth that leads to freedom. the truth, and the life. He's the truth. He's praying in John 17. And he said, Father, would you make us one even as you and I are one? And as he's praying for his disciples, he said, how can we make them one? He said, may they know the truth, and this is truth. He said, thy word is truth. The beautiful thing about him declaring himself as truth and this being truth is they're always in agreement. The living truth and the written truth are always the same. They never contradict. So there's loss of reason. There's also loss of accountability. How can I be accountable to anything more than my preferences? And then there's loss, uh, he said, thirdly, of human value. Why? Well, we're not important, right? You're not important. What's, what is important? My preferences and my feelings. Guys, let me ask you, is that the society we're living in? Watch the news tonight and tell me how many of the stories deal with loss of reason, loss of accountability, and loss of human value. I can tell you right now, you don't have to watch it, all of them, except for the sports and weather. So truth has to be guarded, but it's also not to be hoarded. Truth must be given away. You and I are responsible as members of this new kingdom to share the truth that we've been entrusted with, to communicate it clearly. Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He said, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So there is this cyclical pattern of truth. It is a reproduction style of, uh, if I can say this, reproduction. God put on this earth a natural way for organisms to reproduce. Healthy organisms naturally reproduce. 
And if you and I are going to be purveyors of this truth, and we are part of this organism called the church, which, by the way, understand this, though we are organizational in a lot of the ways that we're structured, we are not an organization. We are an organism. We are living, we are breathing, we are the people. The church is not the building. You and I are the church, and we are a living organism. And it is on our laps and shoulders to be a healthy organism so that we can reproduce. Guys, don't be afraid to share the truth. Because it's the truth that sets people free. That means you have an easy out. How many times have you ever thought, well, I'm afraid of what they're going to think of me? Listen, they're already thinking things of you. Isn't that the truth? They're not going to think anything different, except for maybe you're tongue-tied or whatever. We're responsible to share the truth. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. I was going to put up a diagram, and I decided just to destroy the, the slide. But I want you just to think about the easy math. If each of us here today, this year in 2019, reach one person for Jesus just by sharing the truth in a loving way. At the end of 2019, how many people do we have? It's easy math. The easy answer is twice as many as we have sitting here right now. You thought I was looking for a number, right? Did you flunk math? <laughs> Probably. Okay, so if then twice as many as are here right now do that again next year, then how many do we have? Twice as many as we did at the end of this year. And then if we do that again the following year, how many do we have? Twice as many. Okay, so if we're in this pattern of sharing the truth because we love them and the truth is setting people free and every year we double, how many years would it take to reach the entire globe for Jesus? Do you know? Take a stab at it. Between our 15th and 16th year. You're going, no. Yeah, go ahead and do the math. It's simple to share the truth. But yet there's far more. And what we have done is learn to hoard the truth. Sun Life Ministries did a survey of over 4,000 churches in North America. At the end of that survey... 87% of the churches that were surveyed did 100% of their programming in growth level events to grow Christians in their relationship with Jesus. Now, is that important? Absolutely. It's one of the key elements that we're responsible for, according to Matthew chapter 28. But do you realize that we're also responsible to share the truth with lost people? We also own the responsibility to win people to Christ. We also own the responsibility to equip them so they can serve according to their gifts that we talked about last week. What that means is 87% of churches that were surveyed are hoarding the truth. And how many times do we do that? I don't want to be taken out of my little comfort zone. I don't want to talk to anybody outside the body because I'm kind of comfortable on the inside. I love hoarding the truth is what we're saying. Is it not? The truth must be guarded, not hoarded. It's only effective when we give it away. Secondly, truth is intended, I love this one, for paters, not taters. Truth is intended for paters, not taters. First, it's intended for paters. What I mean by that is participators. I never said I was an English major. 
we talked about how if we don't hoard it, then we also have to be participants in it. Jesus didn't say the truth will set you free. The truth is in, in John 8, 32, you will what? Know the truth. That means you have to participate in it. He didn't say if you hear the truth. He said if you know the truth. To know the truth means I'm actively engaged in it and I receive it into my life. I know the truth and then the truth will set you free. Too many of us know it here, but it never makes it here so that it comes out here. Boy, we can quote scripture verses, can't we? We might not have the references all right. Every now and then we give someone credit that never said it. But that's okay. But guys, we have to participate in truth. Deuteronomy 28 in the Old Testament gives all of these wonderful blessings. But those blessings, read it all the way through Deuteronomy 28, only comes to those who obey the commands, not those who can memorize them. We have to obey. Every believer here this morning can become as powerful as every other believer who's walking in truth. It's not a special privilege for pastors, missionaries, authors, conference speakers. When Jesus said you will participate in the truth and the truth will set you free, it's available to everyone who names the name of Jesus. There's not one person here this morning that has any less power than me or anyone else who's walking in truth. Truth is intended for paters. Are you with me there? Participators. But truth is not intended for taters. Spectators. Too many of us, we love going to sporting events. We love watching football on TV, baseball on TV. We like watching track events, cross-country events. We like basketball events. We have all of these things that we love watching, and we have turned Christianity into a spectator sport because we're so used to spectating everything that goes on in my life that Christianity now is just one of those things that I've become a spectator in. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says that pastors and teachers are supposed to equip the saints so they can do the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. My job is to make sure that you are equipped, that you can have all that you need so that you can do the work of service because God intends you to not spectate but to participate. All believers are expected to participate in truth. I love that. It doesn't matter how tall or how short. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. This book is intended for every one of us to get into it, to understand it, to know it, to digest it, and then to live according to it. And then when we do, it is the power of God. Good stuff, huh? So are you a pater or a tater? If I were to ask you to answer this question, I want you to be honest. Don't answer it out loud. What right now is keeping you from participating in the truth? Is there something right now that is preventing you from participating in the truth? We talked about the gifts last week, and we, we went through 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, and we listed the gifts, and all of those are given to us so that we might edify the church, and I wouldn't doubt you have at least one of those. Are you using it? Are you participating in the truth? If not, what are you waiting for? What's preventing you from being a pater? Or do you like being a tater? Third. The third principle to allow us to be a good steward. Truth is expected to grow, not plateau. 
I know that there are those who believe that if we were to graph a growth chart in the Christian life and our Christian journey, if this is the point in time that I receive Jesus into my life, we believe that our growth should look like this, right? This constant and continuous straight line to heaven. And yet, I didn't see anyone when Brandon asked this morning, how many of you are perfect in your Christian journey? I'm not trying to lower your expectation level. I'm trying to give you a real picture of how we graph the Christian journey. We start here, and then we grow, and then we go, oh, man, I, I blew it, and I fell. And then I pray, and I say, Jesus, forgive me. And he goes, okay, get back in the saddle. And we go, okay, thanks. And then we grow again. And then at this point, we go, oh, man, I blew it. And Jesus goes, yeah, I know you blew it, but I love you. And he goes, yeah, thank you. Would you forgive me? Yeah, thanks. And so we, at this point, confess, and then we continue to grow. That's the Christian journey. And when we understand that, and we have a healthy view of the way that I'm supposed to grow, then I don't get defeated all the time. Have you ever been defeated? Does the enemy get you there? Did you ever go, oh, man, I'm just not a good Christian, and I did this, or I said this, and I went there, and I did this, and next thing you know, you're doing absolutely nothing because the enemy has neutralized you, and you're not growing, you're plateauing. Do you realize that Satan really doesn't want to defeat you? All he wants to do is neutralize you. Because when he neutralizes you, you plateau and you do nothing. Defeat is a natural result of plateauing and neutralizing you. If we look at the example of the early church in the Word, we know that in the the early church, when the church started in Acts chapter 2, they started with just basically, well, not the early church, just before that, the foundation was being laid with Jesus and 12 disciples, right? And we go, wow, that's kind of cool. And then even Jesus lost one, but then he was replaced with Matthias. And so here we have Jesus and still his 11 plus one. And now when Jesus said to his disciples, listen, go back into the city and wait for what the Holy Spirit was supposed to do and God sending his Holy Spirit. And so when they go back into the city, all of a sudden there's 120 of them praying in the upper room. What happened? How did we go from 12 to 120? I don't know. But I know they grew. So there's 120 in the upper room, and they're praying, and the Holy Spirit comes. And then what happened when Peter decided to preach his first sermon? 3,000 were added. You're like, are you kidding me? Listen, I don't know how it happens. I know it does. Now, we don't know how many days later, but there were 5,000 more added. And we go, yeah, but that was was different. Because that's when the Holy Spirit came and did something neat on the day of Pentecost. Okay, let me just ask a clarifying question. Is that not the same Holy Spirit that lives in me? Is that a different brand of the Holy Spirit? So I get it. That was the real deal. I've got the generic version. So I can't expect all the vitamins and vitamins and the nutrients because they had the real deal. I just have the generic Holy Spirit, right? Is it the same Holy Spirit? Is it the same Holy Spirit that's able to do the same thing again? Hmm. So is there an expectation that God, by his Holy Spirit, expects me to grow? Do you understand that then, since the day of Pentecost, through the centuries that the church and truth has continued to triumph, church has continued to grow in spite of traitors, false teachers, persecution, famine, war, Bible burnings, lion's dens. There's all kinds of things, burnings at the stake. There's all kinds of other stuff that has happened. But do you realize the church is continuing to grow and truth is still triumphing? If truth was going to be snuffed out, it would have been snuffed out long ago. And yet God has a way to make it grow. But he wants you to participate in it. He doesn't want it to plateau. That means he expects steady forward momentum. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says, But now speaking the truth in love, speaking what? 
truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Here's the thing that's counterintuitive. To encounter the truth and stay the same as a believer is counterintuitive. It shouldn't make sense to any of us who have received the truth, who are walking by faith and say, wait a minute, I've encountered the truth, the truth has set me free, but yet I'm still the same. That doesn't equate to a believer. Here's the nature of truth. When you and I move forward because we're sharing the truth, which by the way, I know it's not just receiving the truth, it is also sharing the truth. When I live that way, when truth is given out, The nature of truth is I then continue to grow. Most of the time, my growth is thwarted when I'm just busy receiving it and not busy sharing it. Check that in your spiritual life and tell me if that isn't true. That most of the time that you have not grown, it's probably because you're not sharing the truth with others. Now, let me just be clear. I am not talking about Bible thumping. I want to hear me well here, okay? I'm not telling you to go pull your car down in the middle of the only intersection we have with a light and stand on your car and start telling people they're going to hell unless they... I'm not asking you to do that, okay? Because you and I have to understand this. When you and I have relationships with people and they legitimately know that we love them, then the truth makes sense. Understand this. Truth has a travel companion and it's love. That's why Ephesians 4 says you need to speak the truth in love, right? Paul said to the Thessalonian believers, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, he said, when I was among you, I cared for you like a nursing mother cares for her infant baby. So that, he says, eventually in verse 8, when I was with you, I not only shared with you the truth, but my life as well. Truth, being combined with love, is something that God uses to transform people's hearts. Then it becomes very easy, doesn't it? I don't have to feel so awkward when I want to tell someone about the truth of Jesus and what his word says. If I legitimately love them, and if my love is genuine, why wouldn't I tell them about Jesus? Because it's the most important message that deserves the most. And then we talk about this whole thing inside the church of making disciples, winning them to Christ, growing them in Christ, equipping them to serve Christ. That's all relational. If we love them well, all three of those make sense and they flow one to the other. other. When truth is not linked with love, it becomes very legalistic. And it becomes more of a guilt-ridden existence than anything that is freeing. Truth that is shared and truth that is received in love never plateaus. It might fall and then confess and then grow again, but it never plateaus. All right, let me ask you just a couple closing questions. If we realize that you and I are the only guardians of truth on the planet, And we realize that we have to receive it, live it, share it, as we continue to grow in it. The question is right now, as you consider your life and your life alone, not your neighbor's life, not your husband's wife or your wife, this is just for you. Are you being a good steward of truth? One day, I read it from Revelation 20. It's also recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One day when we stand before the mercy seat of Christ, we will give an account for every deed done in the body. Not one of us is going to get away from a judgment with 
what we have been entrusted with. We've been trusted with time. We've been entrusted with talent. We've been entrusted with truth. And we will give an account. Mark my word, as sure as I'm standing here today, I know it's not popular, but we will stand before Jesus and we will give an answer for every deed done in the body. Are you being a good steward of truth? If this morning, as we close, you realize, you know what, I could probably do a little better. In this quiet moment when we just pray, would you say, Jesus, man, you've entrusted with me with this great gift, this beautiful blessing known as truth. And you have said that this truth will set me free, and it has. And you've entrusted it to me as one of the purveyors of truth with everyone else. Jesus, would you allow me then just to share it, to proclaim it, but not in judgment, but out of love? Would you ask Jesus, before we close today, to do just that through your life this week? And listen, don't, don't look at me and say, you know what, that's your job. You're the pastor. Well, then I'll point you to Ephesians 4.11. And I'll tell you, my job as a pastor is to equip you so that you can do the work to build up the body of Christ. We all have to be part of this. I own my responsibility, and I want you to own yours. The good news is when we do, look what happens. In 15 years, almost 16 years, we can see the entire globe one to Jesus. And we're going, come on. The question is, do you want to see the world one to Jesus? Because there are times that's what prevents me. The truth is, sometimes I just don't love like I should. And if I really don't love you and I don't care for you, I'm not going to share with you the truth. But if I really love you, really love you, I won't have any problem telling you the truth. Does that make sense? So spend a minute just quietly before our king of the kingdom. If there's anything that needs to be Repent. Listen, do you think God knows right where you are anyway? Maybe you're in one of these moments where you've, whoop, you've slipped and you're down here. Okay, well then confess that. God already knows that's where you are. He might be saying to you right now, get back in the saddle. Start doing the truth again. Spend a minute. And if you're walking in truth, then celebrate. This quiet time of, of prayer will be a great time for you to celebrate what God has already done and what he's doing in you and providing through you. So just take a quiet moment, and then I'll close us in prayer, and then we'll go. Lord, your word says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And I know in my own life, sometimes I have resisted the sharpening because it hurts. I don't like being honed. I don't like losing bits and pieces. I like hanging on to those things. And yet this morning, God, I want to thank you because I believe that that honing process makes us sharp, effective, and makes us productive. This morning, God, I pray that as your spirit has gone forth, 
I would ask that you would confirm your word deep in our hearts. Allow us, God, to be purveyors of truth, to be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. I thank you for what we've learned the last few weeks about being good stewards of time, being good stewards of talent. Lord, I pray today that we would be good stewards of truth. Allow us to realize the great treasure that you've entrusted to us. Your word is sweet. It is powerful, and I thank you for it. May we not treat it as anything less than a divine treasure. But Lord, as we receive it then, and it becomes precious to our own souls, as we learn to love others the way you love us, God, I pray that we would be good at participating in the gospel. I pray, God, that you would allow us to continue to grow in truth, to not be satisfied with yesterday's growth, but to gain what you have wanted for us to gain today so we might grow today the way you want us to. And so we commit ourselves to you. And Lord, I want to thank you because I believe that as we have already done this quiet business with our heavenly father, with the king of our kingdom, that when we leave this place today, we'll be ready to be good stewards of truth this week. I know that we have an enemy. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy, but you have come that we might have life and have it abundantly. So I pray over each man, woman, boy, and girl in this room today that you, oh God, would give us power, guard it by your spirit then, deep in our hearts that we might guard the truth. And God, I would ask that as we learn to not hoard it but to give it away, as we participate in truth, as we grow, God, I pray that you would allow us to link arms with love so that this week, Lord, it would really just burden our hearts to love people. Lord, I don't know the last time that I was kept awake most of the night because I was burdened for someone that I care for. But I pray that you would do that work in my heart. Do the same for my brothers and sisters here this morning. Oh, God, do something deep because we're all that you have. We're the method that you've entrusted with this great message. So I want to thank you that as we receive the word now, I pray that as we go from this place, we might live differently, that we might <clears throat> obey the truth, that we would know, obey, participate in the truth, and that truth would set us free. And then, Lord, help us to live that freedom in front of others. And kind of like Abdu Murray said, it's really not about autonomy. It's really about freedom. So set us free in your spirit. And for these things, God, I will thank you. I will praise you right now. So that next Sunday when we gather in this place, we will erupt in song as we begin to sing at the service time because of the great things that our God has done this week. You alone deserve our praise. You alone are good. You alone are king. We worship you, and we desire to serve you this week. So send us out of this place ready to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, I ask and pray these things. Amen. Have a great week living the truth.